Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new video and today we are looking at how to be fast in both an F1 car and a GT car because they're very very different so uh, I thought I'd make a video on how to be quick in both because I know it can be a struggle sometimes. But first things first, I wanted to get out there that I'm wearing a Mercedes top in a Mercedes chair whilst holding and drinking out of a Mercedes bottle. So if you ever forget what team I drive for then that should clear that up. Moving into the video, first of all, I'm really happy that everyone enjoyed the ACC versus Real Life Racing Similarities Differences video. You can see that on the card above. It went down really well. Loads of questions, loads of points, comments. So this is a similar style video to that. And I did do a poll and it seemed like the majority of people wanted to see this video. So this video is gonna primarily look at sim racing. When I talk about all these different driving techniques, all the stuff is gonna be sim racing based because I've never really driven a formula style race car in real life. So if there's anyone out there with a spare quid or 1.2 million quid who wants to pay for me to go in F3 just let me know and we can go and confirm all the stuff I said in this video and see if it's relevant in real life that'd be great yes science on a serious note a lot of the points I will say are relevant in real life because driving is driving but yeah I can only really talk about it with confidence from sim racing experience most drivers tend to suit one or the other formula or not formula downforce or no downforce there are drivers out there that can literally drive anything in the sim or in real life but I know a lot of people struggle to adapt between the two and this video I guess should help bridge that gap a little bit and make it an easier transition whenever you go from a GT car to an F1 car or vice versa so yeah without further ado then without further ado is that? so without further ado let's get into the nitty-gritty bare bones of the video so let's talk about F1 cars to start with and how you drive them. And I don't just mean F1 cars, I mean single seaters in general or a car with downforce. The reason I put F1 in the title is because I'm a clickbait merchant and I knew that that would help with some views. But I don't just mean F1 cars, I mean single seaters. So obvious things, let's get them out of the way. Lots of downforce. The faster you go, the more grip you have. Trail braking is very, very important because as you slow the car down, you reduce in downforce and it's more easy to lock a wheel. Plus you don't have ABS as well. So trail braking in these cars is everything basically. Generally speaking, they reward a very aggressive driving style with your inputs. So brake, throttle, steering, and anything in between. It rewards aggressive driving. No driver aids like TC or ABS. They are very lightweight as well. So higher power to weight ratio, which I guess is good to know in the back of your mind before you drive the car. And apart from F1, there's no power steering really in single seaters. So they are pretty savage physically. And the final thing I guess, which is quite important, is their purpose-built race cars, which I guess can't be said for GTs. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, they're purposely built to race. Now let's talk about GT cars. So when I say GT cars, I mean GT3s, GT4s, GTEs, Porsche Cup cars, that kind of genre. Obvious thing again, less downforce, so you're more reliant on the mechanical grip. They reward a very clean, smooth driving style that doesn't really interfere with driver aids. Those driver aids I'm talking about, TC and ABS, they're the obvious ones. Trail braking is, of course, important, depending on the car, but not as important as a single seater because you do have that ABS system to help you out if you do, say, not trail brake optimally. Optimally? Is that, is that how you say it? Optimally. Anyway, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Uh, the cars are heavier, so there's a lower power to weight ratio. So in theory, it's all about minimizing the cornering because they're not very strong in the corners. GT cars, great on the straights, great on the brakes, not great in the corners. I mean, that's a simple way of putting it. Uh, most GTs have power steering, so they're not as savage to drive as a single seater. And a lot of GT cars, you know, we just talked about single seaters being purpose built race cars. Most GTs are road cars modified into a race car. So, big difference there. But I think, yeah, let's, let's get into more detail on the similarities and differences between both an F1 car and a GT car. So I think we're going to start with touching on a few similarities. There's not that many, but I think there's a well, there's loads more differences and they're more interesting. But I think when you talk about both cars, you don't want to overcomplicate things as a driver. You know, they're both cars. They've both got four wheels, a steering wheel, and you're just looking to make a few fine tweaks to switch between the two in various areas. So you're maximizing the car as a driver. I think the first similarity for the most part is setups. I know you have wings and stuff on a formula car that you're not going to have on a GT car to tweak week but for the most part you know if you know what a roll bar does it's going to help with both if you know what a spring does if you know what a damper does if you know these fundamental things in car setup it's going to help you in both because they, they do do the same thing i think another similarity as well is the way you adjust your driving between dry and wet in both formula car and a gt car you brake not earlier but you brake 
less aggressively, you downshift slower, you get on the power a lot more smoothly and you try and feel what the car's doing a bit more. These fundamental things you do when it goes from dry to wet or wet to dry, you know, the other way around, is the same between the two. Another similarity as well is they both take a lot of time to get up to pace because you get a lot of people who just specialize in one or the other. So to try and be on their pace when you're doing the two of them is, is quite tricky and it takes a lot of hours, a lot of understanding, a lot of grinding away, but um, it's possible, you know, if it is possible to be quick, be very, very quick in both. Okay, so differences, there's loads of them. I did have a really good think about every single difference I could think of. A good place to start is the conventional racing line, say for medium and high speed corners between an F1 and a GT car can be really, really different. A good example I think is turn 12 at Paul Ricard, so the long left after the long right. In an F1 car, you've got some video on your screen right now, you can see the F1 car it sort of doesn't need to set up the left as much because it's got enough downforce, enough grip, enough rotation to get through it using a tighter line, which is quicker. In a GT car though, you don't have that grip, that direction change as much. So you need to basically set it up by taking a much more aggressive entry, breaking a straight line, veer it off, and then have a really straight exit. And this is, yeah, I think it's a really good example and it highlights really well the differences in line used in that corner, but it goes for many, many different corners. So yeah, and, and the general gist of that is to basically V off the corner more in a heavier GT because as we talked about earlier you want to minimize the amount of time you're cornering in a car that's that heavy in a formula car that's lighter you can get away with taking a tighter line you don't have to set it up as much because the grip and the lightweight car will it will just allow you as a driver to get through the corner a lot quicker next thing then braking as we've touched on earlier you know you need to trail brake very extreme amounts in a single seater because as you reducing speed, less downforce on the car, less grip, and you don't have ABS to save you. Whereas in a GT car, you do have ABS. And you know, although it's not optimal for lap time at certain points in the corner, if you do make an absolute mess of the braking, the ABS will save you. You might go straight on a little bit, you might run a bit deep, but you're not gonna lock up, which will affect the tire throughout the rest of your lap or your whole stint. So it's a lot more punishing in a, in a single seater, I think it's fair to say. Uh, another big difference is start procedures. So as we know, GT starts tend to be rolling starts starts, which are very, very easy, being brutally honest. Single seaters tend to be standing starts, so uh, using a double clutch in a single seater is a very, very good way to go, learning how that works, because nine times out of 10, it's usually the quickest way to get off the line using a double clutch. It takes a lot more thought and finesse to start a single seater than it does a GT, when you're already rolling at 100 kilometers an hour and you just got to stamp on the throttle to get the car to turn one as quick as possible. Yeah, they're very different. Uh, the mental challenge is a lot harder in a single seater than it is in a GT. It's a lot more mentally taxing, I think, or I, at least in my opinion, driving a single seater, just the, the challenge of it, it just takes a lot of time to adjust. I remember going back in the day from F1 Esports to ACC and everything felt so slow, really easy. I felt like I had so much time to think during corners. Of course, when you get used to that, that's fine. But then when you go back into an F1 sim or game or into a really fast single seater, like when I sometimes I go back into V10R, like in the summer, which is a, it's a formula car on a set of Corsa, like an F1 speed single seater as well. It's really, really quick. And it, it really initially is tough because I just don't have, I'm not used to having to think that quickly. So it takes a few hours to get used to that. And yeah, every time I go back to the GT sim, like an ACC or a Ren Sport, it's a lot easier, which is quite nice actually. But yeah, in single seaters, that's why a lot of people use T-Cam. It opens up your view and it makes things a lot easier to see, which gives you a little bit more, I guess, bandwidth mentally. It's good for wheel to wheel stuff as well, but yeah, in cockpit cam, you really can't see a lot. And when you're going that fast, you need everything on your side to be consistent, quick, accurate. I mean, I know it's not realistic. I know there's loads of people that comment, why aren't you using cockpit cam? I mean, you're in a sim, it doesn't really matter. And it does make it a lot easier. So curb usage is another big difference. GT cars pretty much sail over curbs like they're not there. Single seaters being lower, stiffer suspension, they don't have that luxury. Uh, and that completely changes the dynamic of a corner. If you can't take a curb in one car, but you can in another, the line you take, the amount of speed you can carry through it is just completely different. So it's a big difference that. The amount you can see out of a GT car versus a single seater is very different. Uh, I think GT cars are more restrictive. Some GT cars have a very small windscreen. You've got the windscreen wiper, you've got the A-pillars, you've got loads of different things that restrict your view, like the safety netting as well. Whereas in a single seater, apart from the halo, it's not that restrictive. They can be quite bad, but not as bad, I think, as a GT car. So, and anyway, in a sim, you can always go to T-cam, which helps 
So another big, big difference is in a GT car, which is heavier, softer, it rolls a lot more, it pitches a lot more, dives, squats, the weight transfer is a lot more sensitive. So if you think about it on a scale, you've got a road car, which is really soft and weight transfer is crucial in the way you drive it and it's very sensitive to that. You have to think about that quite a lot when you're driving it. On the other side of the scale, you've got like a Formula One car, which is so stiff in comparison, doesn't roll, squat, dive as much. And you don't have to think about that stuff as much, hence why F1 drivers or people driving a car like that, they can be really aggressive. They don't have to have that finesse with the vehicle as much. That was a, a really big thing for me when switching between the two, is you had to understand that and either rein it back a bit if you're going from an F1 to a GT or vice versa. In the sim, this is this is a thing. The weight transfer thing is a thing, but in real life, it's a lot more exaggerated. I don't think sims replicate it 100% yet. But so if you're understeering for a corner, a good way to reduce that is to get the nose down because that will help the car get through the corner so the way you do that obviously is be on the brakes a lot more and make sure that nose of the car is down as soon as it lifts up say you're on the exit of a corner and you're suffering from understeer if you just slam on the throttle it's going to understeer because the nose is going to come up and it's going to just wash out wide whereas uh, if you have in mind that no i can't have the nose of the car up and you sort of drive to that then it's not going to happen anymore it was a bit of a long explanation that but i just wanted to make sure you understand it and if you have seen my Alpine GT4 lap at Magnicor, a very soft, high car, a GT4. You can see I'm manipulating the weight transfer of the car to get it through certain corners. So yeah, look at that video, it's in the card above, and uh, what a circuit by the way. Great car, thank you to Alpine for that experience. So because the power to weight ratio is a lot more in a single seater car, generally, uh, I find that you can brake a little bit later as a general rule of thumb compared to a GT car. It's another difference. For sim racing, I find that lowering the steering rotation in a single seater or a formula car helps because you can just in effect react to things quicker, react to corrections, react through high speed corners, say Magus Beckett's, having a, a lower degree of rotation will just allow you to get through there without having to put an absurd amount of steering lock on. So anything between 300 degrees to 450 degrees, generally speaking, is pretty good. I find that using a formula style wheel rim, three years ago I was using a big fat GT style wheel rim playing F1 and I, I didn't really know if it was a good or a bad thing I was just using it and then I got a formula wheel and it made such a difference because of the smaller diameter I mean it feels nicer in your hands anyway but because of the smaller diameter again it allowed me to react to corrections and slides and stuff just a lot quicker and more consistently so I know it's money but if you can fork out for that then that might help. I also use a formula wheel now for GT cars for that same reason. It just allows me to be more precise and sensitive and correct things quicker. And yeah, although it's not as immersive, you know, it's all about performance in eSports. So that's all that matters. For GT cars, in terms of braking, I run my brake kg a lot lower in GT compared to a formula car. It's a very good reason for this. It's because I don't have to worry about locking up because of the ABS. So I need to be at 100% brake in GT sims quite a lot. So I want 100% brake to be quite an easy thing to achieve consistently to stop the car as quickly as possible. And I've not got to worry about locking up. On a Heisingvelt pedal set, I've got the Ultimate Pluses. Uh, for GT stuff, I use about 40 kg. But then a Formula car where I need to worry about locking up, I need to worry about trail braking. I run it a bit higher. So something about 60 kg, something like that. Nothing crazy. I don't run it at the maximum 120 kg or whatever it lets you do that. I mean, that's just ridiculous. In a sim where you don't have the G-force to allow you to hit the pedal as hard as you could in a race car, I don't know why you'd ever run it that high, but it is what it is. A general way to differ the two, F1 and GT, I always find in a Formula car it's very hard to get on pace at all without putting a lot of time in. I think it's just because of the speed differences, the aggressive driving style. I always find it a lot harder to get near the pace. Whereas a GT car, or it doesn't matter really what game, I find it relatively easy to get near the pace within sort of two, three tenths. But then with a GT car, I always find it hard to get within that final two or three tenths. It doesn't really take like guts or courage. It, it takes like a certain finesse or certain way of driving or a certain trick to do that. So yeah, they're both challenging in their own way. There's a lot of stuff to digest there, so I think it's probably best that we summarize it into a few clear-cut points. So then, to summarize, when you go from a GT car to an F1 car, you need to do the following. So, trail brake more, brake later, push the car more in medium to high speed corners to utilize that downforce, don't prioritize exits as much in medium to high speed corners. 
Focus on throttle control a lot more on exits because there's no TC to save you anymore. Don't worry as much about weight transfer because it's not as important in a lighter car, so you can be more aggressive. Lower the steering rotation. Increase brake pedal pressure setting so you don't lock up as much. Use a formula style wheel rim. And of course, don't take everything I say as gospel. You know, there will be certain games with certain cars that have random quirks and it might be not what I've told you, but generally speaking, I feel like the points I've hit are a good baseline to go off. Of course, if you're going from an F1 car to a GT car, do the opposite of what we've just summarized because that's, uh, that's how that works. So yeah, let me know if you uh, enjoyed the video, first of all. Second of all, let me know if you think I've missed anything and I'll be intrigued. I always am to see, go through the comments and see what I've missed or what you guys have to say is, is usually very intriguing. And of course, leave a thumbs up, sub to the channel. I really appreciate it. As always, channel's doing great. Hope you're all doing good. And yeah, I don't know what the next video will be, but I will do my best to make it a good one. So thank you for watching this video and I guess I'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye.